For those who have been with us uh, would know that we've been journeying through this series looking at the questions that uh, Jesus asked. And today we're looking at the question that says, why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? And uh, we're going to be unpacking that. I'm uh, going to be doing a lot of uh, sort of more teaching today as we look at this question. Uh, but let's uh, pray and, uh, and ask God just to speak to us all as we look at this question today. Father God, we thank you for your word that it's live, it's active, it's living. And Father, as your word says, useful for teaching and correcting us and training us in all forms of righteousness. And Lord, as we look at your word today, we pray that you would speak into our spirit, that our eyes and our ears would be open to what you want to say to us this morning, we pray. So, Father God, we just thank you for uh, the, the freedom we have to listen either on the phone or computer, to be sitting here in person, to engage with your word as we are this morning. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so prior to the reading that uh, that Ian, <laughs> Joe, uh, read out to us today, um, what we actually see is that Jesus had, had just fed, fed the 5,000 people. Uh, he's just walked on water. He's now in Capernaum, and uh, his popularity is, is growing. And uh, for those who were here a few weeks, about three or four weeks ago, uh, we looked at the question, does this offend you, and talked about Jesus being the bread of life and how he was talking about the fact that he was the bread of life and you've got to eat me, basically, and take me. And uh, a lot of people were offended, and a lot of people started leaving Jesus at that point. However, his popularity still continued to grow. And particularly as we read in uh, John, that at that point, many of the disciples turned away and deserted him. Even though that was the case, his popularity was growing. And particularly through the eyes of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were constantly aware of the tension that was happening, that Jesus was, was not only uh, saying things and, and doing things that were contrary to what they believed, but he was also getting a great following. And uh, though he had concerns about not only the things that he was saying and doing, but even the miracles that were taking place, which was causing all sorts of tensions for the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, to the point that we read at the start of the, the reading today, that some Pharisees and teachers of the religious law now arrived in Jerusalem to see Jesus. Now, it's really important to note this, that they actually travelled over 126 k's to get to see where Jesus is. Um, now, remember, they're walking, they're jumping in their car and just travelling down the road. So they've actually, actually travelled. So there's a small group of them that have travelled to Jerusalem, to Capernaum, to actually catch up with Jesus, particularly to find out more about what was going on and to question him in a lot of ways. So what we actually hear is that firsthand they actually arrive and Mark, uh, who tells the story of what we've just read out of Matthew as well, says this. One day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. <coughs> the Jews, especially the Pharisees, the Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands, as required by their ancestry traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions that have clung to, such as their ceremony washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law asked him, why don't your disciples follow our old, our age-old tradition? They eat first without they eat without first performing the hand washing ceremony. And what we actually have is these teachers of law and Pharisees coming to question. Christian Jesus to find out more about him. And at this point, it's not so much accusation. It's not so much how dare you. It's more about they're intrigued about why is this happening? Why have you got followers and yet you're not following these basic traditions? And what we see here is two major issues that the Pharisees are beginning to have with Jesus. The first one is an issue of clean and uncleanness. So about the whole ritual of being clean and unclean. The second is the battle between the law and the oral law, which is I want to have a look at that today. So first, let's have a look at the issue of, of clean and unclean. And again, as I said, a bit more teaching today, unpacking some of the word. But in Jesus' day, uh, the idea of cleanliness and uncleanliness had nothing really to do with physical hygiene. They weren't thinking physical hygiene. They were thinking about the, the law of being clean or unclean. And although we know that washing hands is a really good thing and it's part of good personal high clean, and, and I guess we've been told more about that uh, over the recent uh, years, in Jesus' day, it was actually about performing the ritual of hand washing more so than washing your hands with soap and water as we would know today. So there was a ritual in the way that was done. 
For a person to be clean meant that they could live in the community. They could go down to the shops. They could particularly worship in the temple. Only a clean person could do that. However, if you're unclean, there was a whole bunch of restrictions about what you can't do and you actually weren't allowed to go to the temple and you weren't allowed in public events because you were deemed as an unclean person. And as we read through the book of Leviticus, particularly chapters 11 and 12 and so on, we actually read a whole bunch of rules and regulations that the, the, the Pharisees and the teacher and law were adopting into their lifestyle about what they can and can't do about what foods they can eat, about what animals they can eat, about what objects they can touch, and if certain things happen, whether they're unclean or clean, etc. So, for instance, in Leviticus 11, it talks about that you can, you're not, that every animal that does not have a divided hoof or does not chew the cud is unclean. So we're talking about pigs, dogs, cats, donkeys, horses, rabbits, camels, all these sorts of animals were basically deemed as unclean. You weren't allowed to eat them. But worse still, if they were dead, you weren't even allowed to touch them. And there was this sense of uncleanness. Now, we know looking at, looking at um, hygiene today, there's, there's actually some real health reasons why you shouldn't be eating those sort of animals in some ways. But there's also, um, they didn't have that. It was about the ritual of being clean or unclean. And because of this, they weren't able to eat or touch these animals. Um, things like dead bodies were seen as unclean. If you touched a dead body, you had to go through a whole ritual process of being clean. Now, again, we know there's some, uh, there's some hygiene issues related to that. But back then, it was about this ceremonial cleaning. Not only that, women with their monthly period were unclean. And there was a whole process for them to go through to be clean every month. And if they didn't go through that process, they weren't allowed in the temple. They weren't allowed to be in a public scenario. Not only this, or Gentiles, anyone who wasn't Jewish, they were classed as unclean. They were seen as outcasts because they weren't ritually clean. So being unclean was really, really an important issue back in Jesus' day. And the fact that it was so important, the uncleanness was transferable. So, for instance, and again, it's sort of like common sense for us in a way, but back then, if, a, if say, a, a mouse ran over a cup, the cup would be declared unclean. But not only would the cup be declared unclean, anything that goes into the cup would be declared unclean. And then if you touch the cup, then you're unclean. And it goes on and on and on. And unless you ceremonial wash the cup, the cup would be deemed as unclean. And there was all these regulations of the day about how this was operating. Now, we look at it and we sort of, again, say it's good high hygiene, but I want to remind you that a lot of what we're talking about was about following the rules and traditions and regulations of the teachers of law and obeying the ceremonial washing and, and, and process. So it's almost like imagining, if you think of it today, you could actually be put in jail if you don't wash your hands. Okay, just This is sort of the concept we're talking about. That's how important their ceremonial cleaning was, that there was, there was a consequence that happened about how you operate it. It's interesting, a guy by the name of Alfred Edisham, in his book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, he actually talks in, in, in depth about what they must do to wash their hands. So this is what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were expecting to see Jesus and his disciples do before they ate the meal, okay? This is what it says. There was water jars ready to be used for the meal, and this is interesting. My mind went straight away to Jesus turning the water into wine with the big ceremonial water jars. They are often used for hand washing. That's what it was about. So the minimum amount of water to be used was a quarter of a log, which is defined as enough to fill one and a half eggshells. So we're not talking a lot of water. It's a little bit of water. This water was first poured on both hands, held with the fingers pointing upwards, and they and they must run up the uh, and the uh, and must run up the arm as far as the wrist. It must drop off from the wrist, for the water is now seen as unclean. So the water goes from the top, comes down, and as it falls off the wrist, that water is unclean. And what he's saying is that um, if it ran down the fingers again, they'd have to render them unclean. The process was repeated again. So in other words, if you didn't do it right and the water ran back down your fingers, you'd actually have to do the process again. The process was repeated with the hands held in the opposite direction, with the fingers pointing down, and then finally each hand was cleansed by being rubbed with their fists together. A really strict Jew would do this not only before the meal, but also between each of the courses. So you can kind of get there's this process that they had about ceremonial washing of hands. So when the Pharisees and the teacher of the law saw that Jesus weren't, and his followers weren't following this, 
it caused all sorts of grief to them. And that's why we see in Mark um, chapter, where are we? What's, where are we? I jumped ahead. That's why we see in Mark chapter 7, it says, Some of the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, Why don't your disciples follow our old age tradition? They eat without first performing the hand washing ceremony. So basically they're saying, you're a rabbi, you've got all these followers, but you're breaking the basic of Jewish law. Why, why is this happening? Why are you not enforcing our old tradition? It's, not, it's bad enough that you're actually hanging out with the outcasts and, you, and you're speaking to the unclean people and you're touching the unclean people, but you're not even purifying yourself before you have a meal. So they're really challenging him about how he's operating. And the thought that they would be having, no doubt, would be, well, if you're not even doing this basic Jewish tradition, then this guy must be a total heretic, that he's not who he says he is, and we've got to, we've got to deal with this. So there's a whole process that they're going through. Which leads us to the question today, why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your tradition? And this is the second question that leads up to the fact that an issue dealing with law. So we're actually dealing with an issue of law now, but not only the written law, but oral law. The written law, which we know as the Torah, is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That made up the Torah. And uh, we, we've got it. It's pretty straightforward. We open our Bibles in the Old Testament and we've got Genesis and we've got Exodus and we can actually read that. We get that. But back in Jesus' day, many of the people weren't reading and they relied upon the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to, to actually read the Torah and to even interpret the Torah, which they did four times a week in the temple. So the written law was, was really important. And as we know, the written law uh, has things like the Ten Commandments, which is in Exodus, which God has given, uh, given uh, us through Moses. But there was a whole bunch of other rules and regulations like the Levitical law, which, as I said, about the hand washing that's in Leviticus. Um, but also it's all designed about, uh, about God's people being safe and healthy and living in peace with God. However, the law, oral law was the law that was spoken, that was traditions passed down from generation to generation. It's actually believed that the oral law is, it began with Moses sharing more of the information that he experienced when he was with God other than just the Ten Commandments. And all these laws started to get passed down from generation to generation, from generation in an oral form. They weren't written. It was all oral. They only had the, 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 the written law. It's actually around 200 A.D., that this oral law was actually finally written down and became called, and I've got to get this right, a Mishnah. And according to the Jewish virtual library, it says that Mishnah supplements, complements, clarifies, and systematizes the comments, the commandments of the Torah. In other words, it's a supplement to the written law. And for, so for an example, we know the Torah which is the first five books of the Bible. In that is Exodus chapter 20, which talks about the Ten Commandments, yes? And it says in the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath. We know that. It says this in Exodus chapter, let's jump to it, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. And this is what we know. We've read it in our Bibles. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week each week for you, your, your ordinary work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the seas and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart to be holy. Now, that's the written law. That was from the Torah. And that's how we're meant to operate with the Sabbath. However, the written law was complemented with the oral law, the mission, which has 39 categories of forbidden labor that were prohibited by this commandment, including dozens of other kind of labor under these 39 headings. For instance, for those real strict Jews today, as they celebrate Passover, they're not even allowed to turn a light switch on. Some of them are not even allowed to open the fridge door. This is the oral law that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. It is not written law. It's oral law. 
And it came and it almost got to the point where um, the oral law became more important than the written law, that the tradition became more important than the written law. And, and dare I say, you can't break it. Sadly, the oral law, as we know, can also be misused and abused, which could lead us back to today's question, which is what Jesus was saying, why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? And this is where we're up to today. So Jesus is challenging the Pharisees and the teachers of the law as to how they are interpreting the oral law and basically you're accusing them of following the oral law instead of the written law and putting that above them and turning all these rules and regulations about what you can and can't do above the fact that the, the, the law of God is all about a relationship with him and with the Father. And Mark unpacks that a bit more this morning by saying to us, and, and Mark, Mark's a little bit different to his, the version that we have in Matthew because Mark unpacks it differently, but he, he basically makes a statement rather than the question of why do you command. So let's have a look at it in Mark. It says, he replied, Isaiah was right when you prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and holding them onto human tradition. So there's a statement instead of the question. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honour your father and mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that, that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father and mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. So what Jesus again is saying is the oral law is outweighing the written law. You've made the oral law, the tradition, more important than the written law. And we actually get this, this, this phrase, uh, Corbin. So in Mark 7 is the, is the one who actually mentions the word. But if you say, if anyone declares that you might have been used to help your father, mother is Corbin, that is devoted for God. So I just want to unpack Corbin for a bit more. As I said, a bit more teaching today. Corbin was part of the oral law, and it means devoted to God, an offering consecrated to God or a gift. Now, Corbin was, was, was approved and used by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And basically what it means is that if a man um, had a whole bunch of stuff and his parents were in poverty or his parents was in need and the parents came to him and said, son, please help me, he could actually claim Corbin and say, well, actually, although I've got millions in the bank, I've already dedicated all my stuff and my money to God and the temple. Therefore, I've got nothing. Therefore, I don't have to help you. Therefore, I don't have to worry about therefore breaking the fourth commandment of honouring your mother and father. So in other words, this process they had enabled them to break the written law. By quoting Coburn and saying, well, actually, I've dedicated everything. So it's like us saying, I can't put any money in the offering plate because I've already dedicated it to God. Therefore, it's already God's. Therefore, you're not going to get anything in the offering plate. Okay, we, we got that. So this is, this is what they're quoting. And Jesus is saying, this is ridiculous. You're breaking the, the law, the written law, by your tradition, by quoting Coburn, by enabling them to get away with it. And you can see now why then Jesus then quotes Isaiah and he says this, Isaiah was right when you prophesied about you hypocrites. And as it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You let, you've let go of your commands of God and you're holding them onto human traditions. He's quoting Isaiah, basically saying you're hypocritical living. It's all about the outward appearance, but you're underlining all the laws and regulations to get what you want. Because remember, they're already giving it and dedicating it to the temple. In other words, there's a kickback. I love the message translation of this. It says, Jesus answered, Isaiah was right about you frauds like you, hitting the bullseye, in fact. These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their hearts isn't in it. They act like they're worshipping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy, ditching God's commands and taking up the latest fads. Wow. 
Basically, it's this battle between tradition and the actual law. You see, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, for them, the religion or their faith was built around certain outward rules and regulations. And if you lived and did the right things, then you're okay. If you washed your hands the right way, you'd be okay. But if you break those rules, then you're in big trouble. And although traditions are important, and most of the time, um, you know, they can be healthy, but they also focus on the external about what the person does, not necessarily about the inward stuff, and they can become quite legalistic. And dare I say today, even in the church in 2022, we have our traditions and our oral laws that have been passed down from generation to generation that have become law, dare I say, law, even though they're actually not necessarily biblical um, laws or mandates. Um, how many times have you heard we've always done it that way? Often what they're saying is this is how it's done. You don't change it because this is the oral law that's been passed down from generation, from generation, generation. Now, we laugh about it, but 20 years ago, when I first started in ministry, actually, what, about 30 years ago now? Wow, gee, that's a bit crazy. I was in a church in, in New South Wales, and I kid you not, we wanted to move the communion table so we could do a drama with the young people. Were we allowed to move the communion table? No way. Because the communion table stays where it is in the centre of the church because it's the central focus of the church and you're not allowed to move the communion table. And we joked back then in those days that the way to move a communion table was every week you move it 10 centimetres, you know, and eventually it will be moved. But the oral law, the written law, sorry, the oral law and the tradition was you can't touch the communion table. Folks, there's no biblical mandate for that. And yet for many churches, there were splits and there was heartache simply because they wanted to move a communion table. I reckon Jesus would have a few things to say about that. Let's go even further. The ballot, I remember about the clothes we wear. It's sitting back down, right, almost where Claire was. I remember as a kid, I would have only been about 13 or 14 years of age, and I had a senior leader of the church sit with me after church, say, I want to see you, and he sat basically, I was sitting in the corner, and he sat on the chair there, so I couldn't get out, right? And he gave me, what I can remember as a kid, a lecturer on what I should or shouldn't be wearing at church. You see, I had shorts and T-shirt on, and I think I probably had taken my shoes off, and I was just in, in bare feet. And he gave it to me that I should be wearing a better outfit because I'm dishonouring God by what I'm wearing. Oral law passed down from generation to generation that we should be in our three-piece suit when we come to church and honour God with our best. Now, there's a theory behind that, which is true. We should honour God with our best. However, we shouldn't have to be wearing a three-piece suit to come to church to worship God, yes? It's about being comfortable. Let me go even further, and uh, I might get myself into trouble with this one, but alcohol. Growing up in this church, growing up within the church, I was told that alcohol is evil. I was told that as a Christian, I should not drink alcohol, that alcohol was wrong. It took me to go to Bible college to actually discover that alcohol is not evil, it's the drunkenness that is the evil. But the oral law that had been passed down from generation to generation to generation said that alcohol and Christianity is not a mix. As I study scripture, Jesus drank alcohol. <laughs> That's what communion actually is, alcohol. We use grape juice because of tradition, and I think it rightly so because if anyone's an alcoholic, they're not going to be affected by us taking communion, whereas if you're an alcoholic, you can't share communion. So that's part of the tradition of why churches of Christ have grape juice. But I want to be clear in saying that it's the drunkenness that the Bible talks about. The Bible does not talk about you sustain from alcohol. You should sustain from drunkenness. And back in biblical days, alcohol was used for multiple purposes. And I want to stress and I want to be clear that drunkenness is not, what, is, is not right. And if you don't want to be drinking alcohol, that's okay as well. But, folks, that is not a biblical law. That is an oral law if you want to go down that path. Am I still with me or you, you sort of turned off? <laughs> But that's the truth. That's, this is how the oral law works. Now, I want to be stressed and say, again, that if you um, are not wanting to drink alcohol, and, and that's fine. And, and if you are drinking alcohol, that's fine as well. And you shouldn't be forcing that upon anyone. Anyone? You know, I'm trying to cover myself here, okay? You're with me. Traditions in themselves aren't all bad. The problem is, is when the tradition becomes more important 
or in contrast with the word of God. Do you hear that? That that's the problem. This is what Jesus is dealing with here. He's talking about the fact that you've placed the tradition above the word of God. And Jesus is challenging the Pharisees and the law. It's not about how you wash your hands. It's not about what you eat or what you drink. It's about what's going on in the inside. And it's about obeying the word of God. And Jesus is again moving people to be looking inwardly rather than outwardly. And then he goes on to say, and this is where he even pushes the boundaries worse. You, you, you know, he pushes it even further by basically declaring boldly that sin comes from the heart, not from what we eat or drink or touch, and that sin comes out of our mouth, and that's how we, how what what defiles us. If we have a look in, in Mark, and this is it was read to us, I'm going to unpack it again from Mark, but this is what Jesus said. He then called the crowd to come and hear him. So in other words, he's spoken to the Pharisees and teaches the law. Now he's calling the crowd, and he's actually saying this. All of you listen, he said, and try and understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Okay? Then Jesus wanted to get away. He went to the house to get away from the crowd. And his disciples came to him and they met him. And they said to him, uh, what he, they asked him what he meant by the parable. And he said, don't you understand either? And I love how um, Matthew says, you know, you, you, you're dull. You don't get it. What's going on? You, you can't understand the simplest of things. He says, don't you understand either, he said. Can't you see that the food you put into your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. By saying this, he's declaring that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. He is just turning their, their oral law, the teaching that has been passed down from years and years and years, he's turning it on the head. He's actually saying, hang on, it's not about what we eat, about the touch, about the way we, it's actually about what's going on in our heart. And for many of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, many who are hearing this, even the disciples themselves, this is just mind blowing what they're about to hear. Because their whole life has been taught about what the rules and regulations are, about what food you can eat, what you can't eat, what things you can do when you're unclean, and what you can't do when you're clean. This would have been mind boggling to them. And he goes on to say, and then he added, it's what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of the person's heart, comes the evil thoughts. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, evil, slander, pride and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. That's what defiles you. You know, it's not about washing your hands the right way. It's not about whether you eat this cut of meat or not. It's actually about the relationship you have with the Father. It's what's going on deep within your heart. That's why he says, why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your tradition? The question this morning is, are there things within your life, traditions that you follow, Oral laws that have been passed from generation to generation that you've been living out that in fact are not a biblical mandate. 30 years ago, I remember having an argument with an elder in a church about the communion table. And it was, I walked away just going, this is crazy. How can a communion table be more important than moving it so we can see young people in the church talking about Jesus. And yet the oral law was preventing that. And let's be honest, folks, we are blessed today, particularly at Peel Street, that a lot of those oral laws you know, we have pushed to the side. And yes, there's traditions we've got to follow, and I think that's important. But it's when it contradicts the law of God or it contradicts the gospel of Jesus that we've got to deal with. And folks, are there things in your life right now that you've, that you've followed all your life? Or maybe things that you've acknowledged that, that you actually go, actually, this isn't of God. You see, the problem is the world is going to keep telling us oral law and tradition. And we even see it today. And I'm going to really push the boundaries and for, you know, it might get cut off the internet and what I'm going to say here. But, but you know, the world tells us that a seven-day work week is okay. And even the busyness of church activity is okay. And yet Jesus talks clearly about the fact that we should be taking a Sabbath. 
that were not designed to work seven days a week. You know, the whole concept of same-sex marriage and, and sex out of marriage and things like that, the, the, the tradition of the oral law is about to, is continuing that that's okay. And even in some churches and even this week in the Anglican church, dare I say, they're battling this. And they're following oral tradition or, or tradition that is man-made rather than Scripture. Even the thought that church is optional, you don't even have to come to church. An old tradition that many people want to believe, but it's just so there's so much stuff that that is spoken about and 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 talked about as if it's law, as if it's, if it's the rule that goes against God's word. And I'm so grateful here at this church that that we're a Bible believing church, and I'm going to always be a Bible believing preacher. And our mission as a church is to help people connect with Jesus, and one of our core values uh, is Bible centered. That we want to make sure the Bible is central, not the oral law, not the spoken law, but the Bible is our law. That's our rule book. That's our guidebook. And along with uh, prayer and evangelism and discipleship and worship, these are our core values. This is what makes us who we are. And I'm not going to apologize for the fact that we continue to be guided by the scriptures, the written word, not the oral word. And there might be a day you come in and the communion table won't be there. And you might want to be upset about it, but if it's not going against God's word and it's going to help us bring people into the kingdom of God, then we've got to be open to that. Question today is, are there things in your life right now that have been an oral law that has been bringing hindrances between your relationship with God? See, following the Bible and God's inspired word and his commands is what we're going to continue to do because we want to help continue to meet, help people connect with Jesus. Let me pray. Father God, I want to thank you for your word this morning. Lord, as challenging as it's been, and there's been a lot of teaching this morning, but Lord, I pray that you help us to wrestle with this. That Father, that we all dedicate ourselves to be followers and students of your word, the written word, the Bible. And, Lord, that, yes, we acknowledge our traditions, but, Father, we also acknowledge that we follow you first through your scripture. And, Lord, forgive us for times over the years where we've allowed oral law or, Father, traditions to get in the way of your, your word. And I pray that you help us to continue to move forward as a church that continues to seek you first with our heart, mind and soul, that continues to place the value of the scriptures as, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the, the key thing of our church. And, Father, I pray for all of us here this morning and those online and on the phone, Lord, if there's things in our life that we need to make adjustments, then, Lord, you'd give us the strength and the ability to do that today, we pray, that we all maybe continue to build our relationship with you within our hearts, not on the outward, but within our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Father God, that's my prayer, and I pray that's the prayer of us all today, that, that uh, Lord, you have your way with us, that, Lord, we'll continue to seek you with all that we have and follow you with all that's in our hearts. So, Father, as we go from here, I pray that you'd watch over us and protect us. Lord, help us to be your hands and feet and voice to this city and beyond, I pray, and uh, continue to return us here safely next week, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, for those who are on the phone and computer, I'm going to end our service right now, but encourage everyone else to stay and have a cuppa. And don't forget, next week, we've got our fellowship luncheon. Come along uh, with some food if you can. Looking forward to enjoying each other's company. God bless.